All right, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kendra Scherenbrock. I'm president and CEO of ProWest, and I have with me uh, Jennifer Ward. She can introduce herself. Hello everyone, this is Jen Ward, and I'm a project manager at ProWest. Um, I've been here with ProWest for, I don't even wanna say it, but uh, 24 years. So, um, been through a lot of projects with Kendis and uh, we'll hopefully be able to give you a little bit of tips on what we've learned in the last few years. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Jen and I uh, have worked at ProWest for a long time. We worked on a lot of different projects and we worked with government agencies all across the country and have probably worked with uh, some of you that are listening in today. And we're going to be talking about winning support and managing successful projects. And like Jen said, we want to share some of our stories and some of our insights uh, with you as it relates to managing GIS related projects. So to kick things off, right, uh, one of the most important things is to understand the business challenge, right? And when we're talking with departments and we're talking with folks, trying to figure out what it is that they need, whether it's data or solutions or a custom application possibly, right, is really sitting down and having an honest conversation about what their challenges are, right? And really understanding what their business workflows are. So the cool thing about being in a GIS role in a city or a county in particular is that you get to work with lots of different departments. And as GIS folks, we aren't going to be experts uh, in highway engineering and assessing and public works and utilities. So it's gonna require a lot of listening and a lot of questions to understand uh, where our customers and in the case of the GIS coordinator or manager or specialist or analyst working with staff is really understanding uh, the different departments and where they're coming from and what their needs are. And a really handy poster that we use with clients a lot, especially when we do strategic planning exercises, is the ESRI uh, nine common patterns of GIS use. And this is a really good, a good graphic to show people, especially when they're new to GIS and maybe you're working on the first GIS project with a department or a particular person is to use, uh, use this as a way to showcase how GIS can support these nine common business patterns uh, in your organization or in a particular department. And you can Google this, uh, nine common patterns of GIS use or nine common patterns of use uh, from Esri. And it's a PDF and you can email it and print it out uh, if you like. And it's really handy to, to help facilitate conversations with people. The next thing when it comes to managing and having a successful project, right, in your organization is to know your stakeholders, right? So when you're getting ready to do a project, know who this project is going to impact and make sure that they're involved from the beginning until the end, right? So that means getting technical people involved, decision makers, maybe you might even need a project sponsor if it's a really big project, like a big strategic plan or a big asset management system integration that maybe you're working on, understanding who your stakeholders are for that project, making sure that they're informed making sure that they're involved in the project from start to finish is really important. And another thing that we like to tell people and really promote is really doing your best. And it's hard right now uh, with the world circumstances, but try to form relationships with other departments uh, throughout your organization as much as you can. Uh, just before a project even happens. And we'll talk about some ways that you can do that too. Um, but forming that relationship with people even before you have a project is important, making sure those stakeholders are identified and involved in the project and that you're communicating with them throughout the whole project. I always say over communicate is best to make sure that everybody's on, everybody's on the same page.
And kind of coming off of that last uh, set of comments from Candace about knowing the stakeholders, that really directly ties back into, you know, timing is everything, right? So as you get to know your stakeholders and you get to know your project participants and the different staff members, you're going to learn the idiosyncrasies with scheduling and seasonal items and things of that nature because you really need to be aware of that. Um, specifically like the example we show here, you know, you don't want to start a public works project in the summer because the odds of getting staff members in for any phone calls, meetings, review is is going to be almost impossible. And that, that's a given, right? Um, there's a very small window of time for them to be doing their outside work and that's when they're doing it. So scheduling is extremely important. Um, in the same instance, you know, if you've got uh, quintile applications for the assessor's department or sales, you know, applications or solutions you're thinking about deploying, you really need to work with those stakeholders to find out, you know, when are their field times, what what months are the busiest for them if they're going to be the most unavailable. Yeah. Another thing that we've run into in the past too, which is is something that I used to never really think a whole lot about until I've gotten to know a lot more intimately some of the staff members we work with are, are things like, um, are there gonna be long-term planned vacations for any of those stakeholders? Or things like maybe uh, there's gonna be a known medical leave for whatever reason or things of that nature, which you know when you start at the beginning of the project doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but once you get into that project and you realize that the person that's gotta be the person that's doing the checking and testing of stuff is gonna be gone for three weeks, kind of puts a kink in the timeline. So it's really important to, to know, you know, timing for individual, seasonal, other things that are going on. And something we've also learned in the past is that if it's a, maybe it's a slightly larger project, well, you do not want to have two or three slightly large projects occurring at the same time because it's going to be a disaster all the way across the board. So there is the whole thing with staffing and people and scheduling and seasons and all those little things that we've learned that really do become a large part of the play on the success of a project. So really important to keep that stuff in mind too. Definitely agree. And so kind of leading off of that portion of, of, of what we're talking about, that does also directly tie into the procurement. So, you know, knowing the stakeholders, knowing the timing, also very, very important is knowing that procurement process at your organization. Um, you know, are you allowed to use outside vendors? I mean, you would think that's a very simple question, but there are sometimes regulations and stipulations that go along with that. You know, are there things in place? Um, because if you've had great conversations with the vendor and you've got plans and you've got it laid out and then find out, well, actually, you know, that vendor should have been on a pre-approved list type of thing. So there's are instances where maybe there's some steps that have to occur prior to you even be able to get that project kicked off, right? Yeah. Um, Right. Yeah. And then another yeah. another thing that we run into on occasion is um, a lot of times with the cost, cost of things. Is is there regulations that are in place regarding, you know, after a certain dollar amount of a project, does it have to go out for RFP? Or mm -hmm. is it a case where um, do you have to have, you know, multiple bids on that same thing? Maybe it's not an RFP requirement, but you have to have another type of bid coming in for the same type of project for cost analysis and comparison. Mm -hmm. And so really knowing that procurement process is really important before the project even begins because there may be some stipulations and loopholes that you have to go through um, before you can really get serious about potentially moving forward. And there's nothing worse, really, I mean, as being as being an organization and having these this great plan, right? You've got this great plan, your stakeholders are excited, you're raring to go, mm -hmm. and then you find out there's some a piece of paperwork that wasn't filled out ahead of time and so we've seen that happen more than on one occasion as well so so knowing that procurement process of your organization is is really important um because you certainly don't want to have that be the thing that ends up biting you in the butt in that project you know something mm -hmm. as simple as that yeah i mean it's it's we work with clients all across the country and if you're listening to this and you're thinking to yourself i really don't know what our procurement process is in our organization find out who that person is and call that person tomorrow and just introduce yourself and ask them about what the process is for your future benefit. Because there are so many people that just don't know how to facilitate um, uh, getting estimates from vendors or maybe you're gonna have to put out an RFP, which is a whole nother ball game, right? So 
knowing, knowing, even if it's just at a really high level, that procurement process ahead of time before you're, you're kind of stuck and you need something done fast, um, is really going to benefit you, benefit you in the end. Or if you haven't talked to your procurement people in a while, you might want to touch base with them and see maybe what new procedures are in place too. But we see that a lot, don't we, Jen? <laughs> Oh yeah, you know, and one other thing that's probably important to, to mention too as part of that procurement process is that a lot of times there might be um, very specific types of proofs of insurance that need to be supplied and things of that nature. And so that's another one of those things that may take a little time to get pulled together. So knowing if if there's certain things that go along with that that are required too is really important. Mm -hmm. For sure. So demos and prototypes, right? So as you're working, uh, as you're working with the technology, and as you're working with the different departments, and you're working through uh, what a solution might look like that you're working on, putting together demos, putting together prototypes is a really great way to engage stakeholders or to generate new ideas or a new excitement around the technology in your organization. So take time out of your day, out of your week, out of your month to make sure that you're setting aside time to put together those demos, put together prototypes, and explain to your stakeholders or your project participants that, hey, I've put together this lightweight demo. This isn't perfect. It's not a complete uh, final product, but it kind of gives you an idea of what we've been talking about. And this will help engage your users engage your stakeholders, and it will help them come up with more ideas, right? Because oftentimes it's hard for people just to envision something uh, without being able to look at something themselves. So really utilizing the technology to put together those demos and prototypes can really help generate a lot of new ideas and to really help you scope out the full extent of the project. Getting buy-in, right? This is this is a this is a biggie. And getting buy-in, getting buy-in, let's face it, can be hard and it can be long. And depending on what you're trying to get buy-in for, can take years, right? Or it could take days or weeks. So making sure, making sure that you're communicating, making sure that you're again identifying those stakeholders and communicating with them building those prototypes, making sure that when you do finish certain projects that you're promoting those throughout your organization, those are all things that can help you get buy-in for the technology. And back to what we were talking about in the beginning of the session, really understanding who your users are that are gonna be using an application that you might be building and really understanding their workflows and pain points that's really key to getting buy-in because understanding where they're coming from and where their concerns are will help you. And sometimes getting buy-in is about money, right? And understanding how much things are going to cost either in your time or in purchasing software or in hiring a vendor, all of these things, um, all of these things require research so that it's clear for your users uh, how much things are going to cost right throughout the project and doing your homework doing that research and really understanding the pain points uh, the things that are preventing the project from happening in the first place if you have that good solid understanding and can start to work uh, to address those challenges that's going to help you get buy-in I know, Jen, do you have anything else on buy-in? I mean, we could talk all day just about buy-in. Well, yeah, one of, one, of the, one of the biggest things that I think we see come across quite often too, and this does tie in with everything you just said as well, is trying to quantify the amount of expected staff time for participation is huge. Yeah. Because if they don't really have any idea, let's say, for instance, you've got Assessor Y, right? And Assessor Y thinks this is a, sounds like a great idea and it sounds like a great project, but they're super concerned that it's going to take 10 hours a week of their time, when in actuality, it might take an hour here and there over the course of a three-month period. So being able to set some, some definitions on expected participation for time, I think sometimes really helps quell some of the fears 
um, that we see going into some stuff and there might be some hesitation about doing things because I think they just don't have time to deal with it. Yep, yep, that's a great point. Happens a lot. Mm -hmm. So outlining the project, um, this is probably one of the most important yet difficult aspects, I think, of any project. Um, you know, you really have to define those requirements, which that right there ties back into everything else we've talked to prior to this, right? It's knowing those stakeholders, it's knowing those workflows, it's knowing those pain points, things of that nature. But you really have to delve into all of that to get the ability to define what are those requirements because i think the graphic here candace is 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 the best picture explanation i have ever seen of of how it actually is yeah. and so and in this in this example you know it's taking something of of trying to interpret what you're being told but to find out actually it was a lot simpler than what it should be so it's having those conversations and it's it's, it's learning all those bits and pieces of the back end to really get hammered out, you know, what are the actual requirements? Um, and so in conjunction with that as well, it's setting those timelines, right? So it's not necessarily just the timelines that you're gonna want to implement for your vendor to provide something. It's also going to be defining those timelines of staff members as well. Um, and again, that ties back into what we talked about earlier, you know, timing is everything, right? Because if it's a case where there's going to be maybe a two week window where staff members are able to test and provide comments and feedback, so maybe the solution or application that was developed and that timeline happens to hit right at the peak of field work, well, it's not gonna happen. And that in turn is gonna postpone a lot of other subsequent things in that project as well. So that's a really important marker to know. Um, and so along with that, setting that budget, nobody wants an unknown value going into anything. It's just, it's not feasible. It's not feasible, it's not safe, right? I mean, everybody needs to know what those expectations are for that budget. They need to know what are the milestones within that project. Um, by having clearly defined milestones of, you know, point A, point B, point C, you've got a way to regulate and to make sure that the project continues to move forward. Um, and again, this ties back into working with those stakeholders, defining those stakeholders and making sure that the stakeholders that are involved are the stakeholders that are going to be involved throughout the entirety of the project, because nothing will derail quicker than having that be up in the air and having that be all over the place with new project stakeholders coming in at different points along the way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think everybody needs to print off that cartoon and put that on their put that on their desk somewhere because yep. it's uh, it's it's definitely things that happen, especially if you're new to, to managing projects, a GIS projects for your organization. Uh, it's 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 definitely a common thing. So hopefully some of these planning planning items can help you help you prevent those things from happening. So lessons learned, right? Um, no project is is perfect, and that's really because we're all we're all human beings, and it can be difficult to difficult to manage, and things happen in a project. And I think that's the biggest thing is that you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared for the unexpected, right? Uh, to to happen, and things do happen. And so Jen and I just thought a little bit about what are some what are some things that we see uh, quite a bit that happen. And one of those, right, is uh, stakeholders. Stakeholders might change mid project. And why is this a risk to your project? Well, it's because if a new stakeholder comes in to the middle of a project, they might have a different idea of what success is they might have a different idea about how something is configured. And all of a sudden, those weeks of work that you and your team worked on might be thrown away or have a risk of being thrown away and go in a different direction. So that's why it's really important to understand, uh, understand and identify those stakeholders and make it very clear in the beginning of the project that a risk to the project is bringing is if someone new comes to the table with a different set of ideas. So all the things that we talked about thus far are going to help you 
in the case where a new stakeholder comes into a project because you're going to have a clearly defined project with the budget and milestones and what the results should be and timelines and that's going to help you educate a new stakeholder right when they when they come in so stakeholders coming in mid project it happens um, and it's important to do and do all the things that we talked about to help mitigate the risks that can occur when someone new comes in mid mid project I don't know. I don't want to hog them all. Jen, do you want to do you want to take do you want to take the next one? Well, you know, the unknown unknowns. We've all been there, right? It's that unexpected stuff that nobody planned for or it's the unexpected stuff that pops up or as I like to call them the oh by the way pieces that pop up from time to time. And in one thing that I think we've learned over the course of working through a lot of different projects is that Sometimes those unknown unknowns are actually good things because you learn something where you're like, whoa, that's great. Other times you're like, hmm, not so great. But what we've learned to kind of kind of navigate through is, you know, you kind of got to roll with it and you are not going to be able to define those unknowns at the beginning of the project. You are going to have things that are going to pop up and the severity of those unknowns are really unknown until you come across them. Um, mm -hmm. So by having those clear defined you know, project goals and those timelines and everything defined in there, I think it makes being able to deal with those unknowns as they come up a lot easier. And by having the right stakeholders involved on client ends or vendor ends to begin with is really going to make it a lot smoother of, of a transition and dealing with it. And let's face it, one of the biggest risks of the unknown unknowns is your budget, right? If something pops up mid project, and a bunch of data has to be created or maybe you need to pull data from another system that's going to cost money from another vendor for example right those unknown unknowns can certainly impact your budget so that's why it's really important to make sure that you have some buffer in your budget and to make sure that your project group and your stakeholders have talked about what do we do if something, if one of those unknowns, unknowns comes up and it affects our budget or it affects our timeline, especially if you're working on a project that has a really tight timeline. If some unknown pops up, pops up that affects the timeline, it's really important to have a plan in place that's going to work for your group to handle things that might adjust the timeline or the budget. Absolutely. Talk about it. Talk about it before it happens, right? <laughs> And the last one on here saying no, and this, 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 is, this is hard, this is a tough one, because oftentimes uh, you're in the middle of a project, you're on a roll, you're building solutions or you're building data and things are going great and people are collaborating and then all of a sudden somebody wants to do something that's just gonna completely derail things, right? Um, or maybe somebody has a great idea, but just doesn't quite fit into the scope or the budget of the project. And it can be really hard. It can be really hard to say no, and it can be really hard to kind of redirect um, those kinds of conversations. And again, everything we've talked about so far um, with having your stakeholders and the budgets and the planning and all of those things again are really going to help direct the conversations um, throughout your whole project so if somebody does have some new ideas that are really really great but they don't fit into the existing timeline and budget you're going to have all that documented so it's easier to have that conversation about hey that is a great idea we're going to put it on an enhancement list and we're going to budget and plan for this for the next round of updates, maybe next quarter or the following year, that type of thing. So keeping that kind of list of enhancements or changes that people want to make and really making sure that you are aligning those requests to your scope of work to make sure that they're always in line. So scoping that out when Jen was talking about the importance of all the project scoping components, that's really key to helping your project stay on track. Yep, 
and and I can say I think Kenneth on behalf of everybody at Pro West too is we don't like saying no. We just don't have a choice sometimes. You know, <laughs> as much as you don't want to hear us say no, we don't like saying it either. But sometimes you just have to roll with it. Yeah. And it's and it is hard. It's it's really hard. And especially if you have a larger group of people that you're working with on a project, maybe multiple departments on some collaborative initiative. It is hard. It's it's really hard. And that's why that project a plan document is is so critical. So you get done with your project and it's a successful project. And what's the best thing you can do with a successful project is to really promote that success because that success is going to help drive GIS and location technology initiatives throughout your organization. And it's going to help generate new ideas for new projects, right? So when you finish your project and your users have been using their new solution for a while, it's great to revisit your users, your end users and find out how are things going? How much time is this saving you? How much money is this saving you, right? Find out and quantify what, to the best of your ability what those results are. If you have a newsletter, that your county has uh, put an article in the newsletter about the project and talk about why we did the project and who was involved and what the results were and why it was important to the county or the public that the county or city served, right? If you have the opportunity to present at your county board or city council or whatever governing body that you might have, get on the agenda, even if it's for five minutes just to kind of talk about your project and why you did it and what the results were can really go a long way to help generating ongoing support for your organization. Don't be shy to, to get out there. Press releases are also huge. We have clients all across the country that really utilize press releases. And sometimes it's really hard to say, gosh, I really don't want to toot my own horn. It really wasn't that big of a deal. I'm just doing my job. But it's really important, uh, especially if you have a public facing solution that's going to be promoted out there to the public, putting out a press release, uh, putting out a press release can generate a lot of interest and a lot of traffic to any public facing uh, solutions that you have out there. So work with your um, work with your communications department or who's ever responsible. Uh, for publications in your organization. I know here at ProWest, Jenny Miller, our marketing manager, she helps our clients out all the time with press releases. So they can be a great way to help promote your public facing sites. Um, we've also had a lot of clients that have looked uh, at other industry publications to write small articles or big articles about the work that they've done. So if you've done something for public works or utilities, uh, talk to those folks in those departments and find out find out what industry publications are out there for the work that they do and uh, generate an article, put those out there. It can be another really great way to gain uh, support and interest and knowledge in GIS in your organization. And then finally, social media, right? We love it, we hate it. Twitter, yes, Twitter, no. It's all across the board how people feel about social media. Some clients, some cities and counties use social media. Some just use pieces, so they might just, just have Twitter or just have Facebook. But social media, if you have social media at your organization and you have a successful project, especially if it's something public facing that is serving the public um, and the taxpayers uh, in your city or county, definitely use social media to, to get that out there. So, lots of different ways to get the word out. And as GIS people, lots of times we're, we're highly technical. And some of these things might make our hands kind of clammy, like, oh man, I just really don't want to write something or looking at posting something in a, in a magazine, right? Um, but find someone in your organization that is good at those things, right? or reach out to a partner like ProWest or reach out to your neighbor who might have done something similar and see how they did it, right? And get some help too, because these are all things that can really help jumpstart GIS 
uh, in your organization and keep it at the forefront. Jen, do you have any thoughts on thoughts on any of that? There was one more thing that I thought of that kind of ties back into the whole organizational newsletter. So if it's a case where you don't have that type of thing set up at your organization, one other thing that I think we've realized is really beneficial is even if you can get a little show and tell session with all your departments, because I'm telling you, there is nothing that sparks interest by being able to say, hey, we're going to have like a half hour meeting here's you know here's what we're going to do maybe it'll be online maybe if you're lucky enough that you guys are back and in place and in person you'll get together in the council mm -hmm. room or the commissioner's room or whatever to do a little show and tell of that successful project that you have yeah. and i can guarantee you nothing sparks more interest than if you get uh, maybe there was a science management application you did for your highway department that you could show off there is nothing that'll spark interest and potential engagement from other departments by seeing success that's occurring in one of their other departments right in their own organization. Because that'll mm -hmm. cause them to start thinking, well, if we can do it for that, how can we implement GIS in our department more to make it more beneficial for us and for our public? And that yeah. show and tell session, you wouldn't think so, but sometimes that is almost the the win-win across the board for showcasing the hard work you put into it as being part of that project, but then to also generate interest in other things as well. Yeah, for sure. And obviously right now with work schedules being fluctuating a lot, right? Some people are at work, some people are at home, some people are all at home, right? Do like a lunch and learn. I mean, we have lots of clients that'll do host like a little lunch and learn just for a half hour over lunchtime, something you can do uh, over Teams or WebEx or Zoom or whatever um, virtual video conferencing software your organization uses. But uh, it's, yeah, it's it's a great, quick way to, to showcase to showcase what what you got. So don't don't be afraid to put yourself out there and and do those kinds of things because it really does help. So that's a quick overview, right, of project management uh, as it relates to GIS and some of the things that we've learned over the years. And we could talk all day about this but wanted to give you wanted to give you a quick quick insight into some things that you can do to plan for uh, successful projects moving forward. And we hope that we, you got a lot out of it. And uh, we hope to see you at a future conference uh, in person where we can talk about these things more. <laughs> right. And thanks so much to Jen. Jen. Jen works uh, on projects every single day, all day long, and it's really awesome to have her be a be a part of this and to share some of her experiences. It is invaluable. Hey, it is a great job to have because there is nothing that I find makes me happier than having a project that's successful that somebody can show off in their organization because they look like rock stars. And that is just fabulous. It is, it is. So get out there, have a bunch of successful projects. We wanna hear about them. Uh, we hope to see you out there on social media promoting all your great work. And thanks so much for tuning in, everybody.